Thank you so much. And uh, can you hear me? It's working. And thank you for coming out on such a really rotten, horrible day. I can see, um, actually, a number of you have taken off your shoes. And actually, I'm going to do the same because I actually hate, actually, my daughter's going to be very upset at this. But, uh, okay, so. It's just, you know, I was going to rush up and get some shoes from my office, but I haven't had time to do that. So uh, thank you, uh, Liz, and for the HMNH and HU and Harvard, Uni Harvard University Press. I'm really uh, uh, pleased to be here tonight. It's been a long time in the making. Uh, I started this book, actually, when I was a postdoc with uh, uh, sitting next to Fuzz Crompton over in the MCZ, and uh, uh, things have really changed since then. So, um, and poor Fuzz has had to suffer through uh, much of this book, including many of its chapters. So. Uh, so thanks to Fuzz as well. So, um, so many of you, when you wake up in the morning, <laughs> probably, uh, you know, some of you may look in the mirror and think, gosh, what a beautiful head I have. Uh, I, when I look in the mirror, think uh, that every day I'm looking more and more like a, a Groucho Marx or one of the other Marx Brothers. You can, <laughs> you can tell me which Marx Brother you think I look the most like. I think I'm a kind of an amalgamation. But the chances are that most of us, whenever we look at in our faces in the mirror or at each other's heads, we think that our heads are pretty normal, that, uh, that there's nothing particularly special or odd about, uh, about the human head. But actually, I beg to differ. I think the human head is actually remarkably different from any other mammal, including our closest relatives, the chimpanzees. So let me just go through a few of some of the, my favorite ones. And uh, uh, it was very nice that Barbara Streisand posed for us. But um, <laughs> so one is that most mam mammals have very narrow heads. And they, have, um, and they have very flat brain cases. But we have extremely wide heads and very round heads. Um, our forehead is vertical, unlike most animals. They have a very flat forehead. We have very prominent eyebrows. Uh, we're, most animals, uh, they have, you can't see the whites of their eyes. The, eyes. the sclera of the eyes are colored, but we have very visible and, and prominent whites. Um, we're the only animal that can really pick our nose with, uh, with any real efficiency. <laughs> Other animals have noses, but the, they don't have a true external nose that sticks out with a kind of vestibule that. Uh, that seems to have no function other than to get you embarrassed at your grandmother's house. <laughs> we completely lack a snout. How many other animals can you think of that don't have a snout? It's a actually a very, very important difference between humans and all other mammals. We have a very small mouth with very small lips. Our, many of our teeth are small, such as our canines. We're the only species that has a chin. And by the way, I will not be able to tell you why we have a chin. But we, nonetheless, just be proud that you have one. We have relatively thick tooth enamel for a creature our size. We have a tongue, and instead of being long and flat and rectangular, is very short and round, with a, and it's, it positions the, the larynx very low in our, in our necks. We have almost no fur on our heads, except for a little bit on the top. And our necks are very bizarre. Most animals have necks that are horizontal. They come out the back of the head in a sort of cantilevered fashion. But we have very short necks that are very vertical that come out of the middle of our heads. And we have <coughs> very large ear holes, and our heads are nearly balanced. And our brains are five times the size you predict for a mammal of the size of our body. So actually, when you look in the mirror tomorrow morning, just think, gosh, I have a really weird head. Uh, because uh, from, a, from a comparative perspective, that's actually true. And in fact, your heads are also very weird compared to other hominins. If we were to meet a Homo erectus or a Neanderthal on the street tomorrow, which sadly is unlikely, but uh, just imagine you were, you'd basically be the same from the neck down. All the differences between you and a Neanderthal or Homo erectus essentially lie above the neck. So, so heads not only make us very different from other creatures, they make us very different from our closest living relatives or non-living non relatives. So if we want to understand what happened in human evolution, there's, we, it's inescapable. We really need to understand what happened to the evolution of the human head. And so basic questions are, why does the head look the way it does? And also, what were the selective forces that operated during evolution to make our heads the way they are? So uh, the problem with that, though, is that heads are really complicated. And when I first started working on this book, I actually thought that was a problem, but as I, as I, you know, I was a naive postdoc who thought that I could just solve all the problems of the world by being clever. Um, I learned, of course, over the years that um, I'm not that clever and the head is way too complex for me. But, but the other thing I became interested in was just how, that, just how important that complexity is. And I'm going to try to make the argument today that actually it's the complexity of the head and the nature of its complexity that actually makes the head so evolvable and so uh, functional. So I put together this little pamphlet. It's just short reading, um, 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 something you could you know, read uh, um, in the bathroom, perhaps. Um, 
it's um, 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 but in the in the in the in the process of this, I really tried to answer three questions. The first was how do heads grow? Uh, in terms of just how do the tissues themselves grow, but also how do we grow from, from early embryogenesis all the way up through adulthood. Um, we also wanted to know how the head functions. After all, you think about your head, almost every uh, particle that enters your body goes through the he your head. Almost all our sy systems of sense are in our head. We, we smell and we taste and we hear and we, and we, and we, and we sense balance in our head. We, we think in our heads. We speak in our heads. We do thermoregulation in our heads. We do all kinds of fascinating functions, all packed into one tiny little sort of soccer ball sized uh, um, uh, area. And then finally, how, did we, how do we put all that together? How do we put together information on the development of the head and also the function of the head to interpret what were those major selective forces that occurred in our evolution? So we'll look at the origins of the first hominins, the origins of the genus Homo, and finally the origins of our own species, Homo sapiens. And together, really, uh, I think that the head offers a really novel and, uh, not novel, but very interesting and important um, uh, 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 set of uh, data to answer a larger question that's important to evolutionary biology, which is how do complex things function and evolve? And the head, because we so kn know so much about heads and how they function, and we know so much about human evolution, we know much, so much about human development, that actually we can sort of put together that story in a way that we really can't uh, do so well for a lot of other organisms. So, so today, I'd like to focus uh, on just three questions. Um, the first question is, how do really complex things like heads function and evolve? And then we'll use that information, uh, combine it with some, a, little bit of, some, a little bit of development, a little bit of function, to think about what were the major changes that occurred to the human head during our evolution to make them so special. And then finally, just for fun, I thought I'd do some little speculating on, on the future of the human head, just to leave us with um, some food for thought. Okay. So, the first issue I'd like to address is complexity. Now, complexity has a long and, and tawdry history in evolutionary biology, um, and uh, many people, when they think of complexity, think of, of the famous uh, uh, um, uh, ideas of William Paley, who, who, by the way, lived in the same rooms as Darwin at, at, uh, at Christ Church College in Cambridge, though, of course, before Darwin. And Paley was sort of the founder of natural theology, and his, his feeling was that his belief was, his argument was that heads, uh, or well, he didn't argue about heads, but, but many biological things are so complicated, like a, like a watch, right? There's so many springs and mechanisms and gears that there's no way they could just have been assembled higgledy-piggledy by, by evolution and by natural selection, that that complexity requires its evidence for uh, a divine maker, some, some engineer out there, a watchmaker making things like watches. And if you think a, a watch is complicated, my gosh, just think how complicated a head is, right? Um, a head has tons of components, right? Um, and we'll talk about some of those components. And they have to grow in size. So Shirley Temple's head started off the size of a pea and got up to the size of, well, Shirley Temple's head. And, and in doing so, it had to change shape uh, um, over, uh, that's actually not her as an embryo, but uh, we'll see this, but I, I tried Googling that and I couldn't find that. Um, um, but in doing so, it not only had to change in shape, um, it also had to change in function and all fit together. Um, just think about all those vital functions that occur at various learning institutions of learning. This is a, not Harvard, of course. But, but you know, as heads are growing, you have to be able to chew and talk and see and breathe and kissing is pretty important and protecting your brain and listening and smelling and swallowing. If any of those functions are compromised during the development of the head um, or during the ontogeny of the head, um, you'll be quickly removed from the gene pool. So how do we manage to pack all that complexity in, grow it, and still have all that function uh, in such a small, small space? As a thought experiment, imagine that you're an engineer, right? And you're, um, you've been asked by, uh, by your company to, um, to build a, a robotic head. And uh, <clears throat> further, just to make your job challenging, they told you to make it more or less the size of a human head, and it should do all, all the sort of things that a human head does, right? And that's, um, of course, you'd quit at that point. But <clears throat> if, you were, if you were desperate for the job and tried to actually do it, uh, imagine that your additional challenges were that you'd also have, that robot would have to be able to grow from, say, the size of, let's make it easy, from the size, say, a walnut to the size of a soccer ball. And it would also have to function all the time while it was growing. That little, that little robotic head would have to be able to chew and to think and to see and to hear and to swallow and to drink and to speak and do all the other things that we want the head to do. 
but we'd also have to be able to adapt to a wide variety of conditions, right? Uh, like <laughs> Cambridge today, right? Uh, cold and hot and wet and dry and bright and dark and noisy and quiet and arid and humid and all those sorts of things. And finally, it can't be too big, right? It has to be a nice size you can fit into a box so you can sell it, right? So, um, obviously, there's no engineer on the planet who could even contemplate uh, at this point how to even accomplish that. It's an impossible task. But obviously, natural selection has done a terrific job, right? And the way in which we have done that, well, not we have done that, natural selection and evolution has done that, through, through a complex interplay between two basic properties of organisms. And, and this is, a, this is a, a common thread through a lot of biology now, thinking about the relationship between how organisms are assembled from units, and those units are, are modules, we call that modularity, and your head is comprised of lots and lots of units, right? But those units are also assembled and put together and integrated in a complex way, um, so we have to integrate those models so they fit and work together. So an analogy might be that say you're uh, making a head out of Legos, right? So the units, the modules, would be those different Legos, and the integration would be the way in which you, which you uh, put those Legos together to create uh, a head, right? But, but the difference, of course, is that our heads are far more complicated than this uh, rather spectacular Lego head. And that's p because we have many more modules and many more interactions. So modules are hierarchical. They, they, at the very basic level, they're, they're genes and base pairs, but proteins and cells and organs and tissues and, and entire regions of the head all function to certain degrees as units. And those units are interacting at many different levels and during many different times in development through genetic interactions, so different parts of the genome are interacting. But also, there are interactions between cells. Cells are signaling to each other, causing them to, each other to die or to, to change character or to, or to, um, or to grow in size or, or replicate. And there are interactions between whole regions of the head. I'll show you some of those in a second. And finally, there are interactions between the head and the entire body. As you, as you secrete growth, growth hormone, it causes your, your whole head to grow in concert, right? So, so there's many different interactions occurring all the time between many modules at many different levels. Sounds kind of complicated, right? In fact, it sounds ridiculously complicated. How could anybody possibly understand all those models, those modules, and all those patterns of integration? And the answer is, of course, that none of us do actually understand all those units and, and, and all those interactions, but we try to find ways in which we can uh, reduce the complexity so that we can begin to make some sense of it. So one example is a set of experiments that I've done with a colleague of mine, Benedict Holgrimson, in which we've been using mice as our models, right? We've been using mice from the same genetic strains, uh, backgrounds, but with particular, um, particular um, deletions or mutations uh, that cause certain craniofacial abnormalities. And we've been breeding them together and having lots of fun creating mice with big brains and small brains and big faces and small faces, et cetera. Um, because, of course, we can't do this with humans. And um, not that we want to do this with humans, don't worry. <laughs> Um, but, but one of the things we we've, you know, we've notice, as people notice when they study uh, uh, correlations among in, in other skulls, or even when looking in among human skulls, is that when we start to measure our mice, for example, we measure the height or the length or the width or whatever, of various bits of the skull, and we compare the correlation, so how well, how much one unit changes with another unit, uh, independent of size, we find that many features in the skull, not all of them, tend to correlate with other features, often even in random patterns. So the width of the nose will correlate with the height of the back of the skull, or the, the width of the skull will correlate with the, with the length of uh, some tooth. And we find lots and lots and lots of correlations throughout the skull. And this is a part of the fact, a uh, reflection of the fact that there's so much integration. As one thing changes in the skull, lots of other things are changing in the skull. And a more formal way of describing this, which I'm showing you here for um, for humans and chimpanzees is that as skulls grow in size, so this graph measures size on the x-axis, and this is a principal component of shape. So what I've done is I've asked, um, taken lots and lots of measurements of a bunch of chimpanzees and a bunch of humans and asked what are the things that all change together in concert uh, uh, in, 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 uh, that when you change one thing, what else changes along with that thing, right? And it turns out that that first component of variation explains an astonishing 84% of the variation in that sample. So as humans and chimpanzees march up in size, they change everything. The shapes of the chimpanzee skull and the human skull change in concert, of course, though with different slopes, which is why, although chimpanzees and humans are fairly similar, when we start off 
uh, when we're born. Uh, as we grow, we diverge in shape, but we diverge according to similar patterns of, of, uh, of, that, of, of covariation. And that's because uh, that's, bec that's a direct reflection of all this integration that is occurring in the skull. And this integrative system uh, starts off very early in development. In fact, it starts from the very, very earliest stages of development when uh, the, the body develops from different uh, lines of cells, from mesoderm and ectoderm and endoderm, the, the three basic tissues, uh, three th germ layers that, that start the head uh, and the body. And they're all interacting with each other. And very early on, the, in the embryonic head, you form a neural tube and a brain. And in between, and you form a face. And in between, you form a cranial base. And we know from all kinds of studies that the brain and the cranial base are interacting vigorously. And different parts of the cranial base are acting with each other. And different parts of the brain are interacting with each other. And different parts of the face are interacting with each other. And the face is interacting with the cranial base. And the face is interacting with the brain. And everything is pushing and pulling and interacting in various levels, in various ways, throughout development so that the whole head is growing in a complex and integrated fashion. So you end up with a brain, a cranial base, and a face, but they're not totally independent units. We, we like to pretend they are because it makes life easier, but they're not really completely independent. And in fact, that integration continues as we, as we grow into being adults. So a typical, uh, one way of thinking about the head is that your head is filled with organs, right? You've got a brain, and you've got a nose, and you've got eyeballs, and you've got uh, a tongue, and you've got eardrums and things like that. And each of those organs is surrounded by a skeletal capsule. So the brain is surrounded by the brain case. And your, your nasal passage is surrounded by, by a nasal capsule. And your eyeball is surrounded by an orbital capsule. And your mouth is surrounded by a palate and a jaw. And, and uh, so all these, um, these capsules um, form matrices. In fact, this is an idea that was proposed many years ago by a man named Melvin Moss. It's called the functional matrix hypothesis. And an important part about this functional matrix hypothesis is that as the brain changes, it changes the shape of the capsule around it, the brain case. And as the nose grows, it changes the capsule of the nose around it. But also, many of those capsules are not independent. Just think about it. The roof of your eyeball, uh, of, your, of your orbit, above your eyeball, is, is the same bit of bone that is the floor of your cranial base, so below your brain. And the top of your of your, the roof of your mouth is actually the floor of your nose. And the inside of your nose, right, of the, out, the lateral wall of your nose is actually the, the, also the, the wall of your eyeball and, and, and so on. Every bit of bone, almost every single bit of bone in the skull is actually shared between different spaces and different capsules so that everything is interacting with everything else as the whole thing grows. So let's take uh, my favorite organ in the head, the nose. Uh, I don't know why I'm so fascinated with noses, but uh, maybe it's because mine is so big. Um, but uh, so the nasal capsule is here in the middle of this rather <laughs> gruesome photo here in the middle of the head, and you can see there's a there's a hole, there's a scroll-shaped bones there that that for which the mucosa attach that create a that make the nose very functional. And as we breathe, the resistance from airflow as we breathe actually helps induce the growth of the nose. So if you don't breathe through your nose, you actually grow a very small nose. Actually, it turns out. Um, but just look at it. The nose is sitting in there in the midst of all these other rather gruesome-looking capsules, right? So for example, you have the brain on top. So the growth of the brain actually affects the growth of the roof of the nose. Uh, the, the, the cranial base is also in there. And the, the uh, nose is actually part of the cranial base. So other parts of the cranial base, gr as they grow, they affect the nose. Um, the oral cavity is the base of the nose. So if you change the shape of your oral cavity, if you make your oral cavity wider, you have to make the base of your nose wider. And your eyeball is the, the inside wall of your orbital capsule is actually the outside wall of your nose. So the shape of your eye capsule affects the shape of your nose. And even, of course, overall growth of the head will affect the shape of your nose. So these, all these different factors in the sinuses as well are all interacting. And everything is pushing and pulling on the walls of the nose to affect the shape of the nose. And the end result is that when we grow our noses, and I'm going to continue my Harry Potter theme, <coughs> This, the nose, always, you know, the, you know the, the, the wand fits the wizard? Well, the nose also fits the face, right? So if you have a, a kind of a narrow face like uh, Daniel Radcliffe, you're going to have a fairly <coughs> narrow nose that fits your face. And if you have a, a wide face, I can't remember if it's crab or goyle, but, um, but uh, his, his nose fits his face. And in fact, if you even don't have a nose, your nose somehow <laughs> manages to fit your face. It always somehow seems to work out. Another example <coughs> is um, how the brain and the face interact. So again, the brain is the, 
of course, the largest organ in your body, and it's sitting on top of the cranial base, which is sort of a, a shelf, a platform in your skull. And we know that as brains grow bigger, one of the ways our, our head accommodates those bigger brains is by <laughs> flexing the cranial base, as if you took your, your, your bread pan and you made the bread pan more flexed so that you could fit more, more bread in the same area of pan. Um, but the face is also growing beneath the cranial base. And if you want to make your face longer, you want to accommodate a bit more of a face, one of the ways we do that is by flattening out that cranial base. So there's this kind of push-me-pull-you between the brain and the cranial base constantly during ontogeny so that they're, all, they're both reacting to each other so that everything accommodates everything else. And we see this during development. So this is a graph of, uh, against age, against uh, the, the angle here of the cranial base. And we start off, we have very flexed cranial bases. They're, excuse me, very flat cranial bases. And as the brain grows very rapidly, it goes oing, it, it flexes very rapidly. And then, as the face starts growing, it flattens out again. And then, as the brain starts growing, it flexes again and gets more angled. And basically, it's like a it's like a yo-yo. It's going up and down and up and down because everything is pushing and pulling on that cranial base, and it's working in the middle there to make sure that everything fits together. Um, and of course, the cranial base itself helps guide that because we can also affect how the cranial base itself is growing through the various joints and hinges and and growth fact growth centers in the cranial base, which can also affect. Uh, how well it reacts to those forces that are acting upon it. So it's a very complex system that permits accommodation. And it even permits accommodation when things go terribly wrong. So for example, if you have hydrocephaly, when you have water on the brain, you have too much cerebrospinous fluid, and you have this essentially enlarged brain case, we can still often fit that enlarged brain case on the, on the face because the cranial base can accommodate it. And we have a, an overly small brain because of microcephaly. Again, the cranial base can help adapt so that the face and the brain can still fit together and form a reasonably functional uh, unit. And we have other uh, syndromes, such as Down syndrome, in which there's a perturbations to the way in which the cranial base itself grows. Everything else is manages often to accommodate fairly well so that the whole <coughs> thing can more or less fit together. So as you can see here, it's, there's no place to stand here. Oh, no, I'm standing here. So, a key point about this is that that accommodation is not only important for permitting the, the skull as a whole to grow in, in all of us from embryonic stages all the way up to adulthood, but it's also important in evolution because evolution has taken advantage of those same mechanisms that occur during development to allow a lot of variations to occur, right? So you can have bigger teeth or smaller teeth or bigger faces or smaller faces or bigger brains or shorter faces. All of those different variations have been accommodated during evolutionary history by taking advantage of those basic mechanisms that we already use, essentially, to grow our complex heads. So you can tell I'm a little bit obsessed with the cranial base. It's like, for me, a bit like the like feet. You know, I'm really interested in it. But we know that, for example, our, our we, grew, we evolved from something that was sort of chimp-like. And they have fairly small brains and long faces, and they have a very flat cranial base. But there are certain australopiths, such as this Australopithecus boisei, a robust Australopithecus, which I'll show you a little bit later on in the lecture, which had a slightly larger brain and a shorter face, and it has a much more flexed cranial base. It all follows the same basic rules that we think operate in human development. And more recently, for example, we evolved from creatures like our, this archaic human um, that have flatter cranial bases and longer faces, and we shortened up our, our faces and accommodated that to a large extent by flexing that cranial base, which gave us, our heads, some of the basic shapes and properties that we now have. So in short, our heads are really pretty remarkable. They're able to function really well. Um, and we're able to grow and develop and also evolve, not in spite of the complexity, but actually because of the nature of the complexity in the first place. That our heads are structured in such a way that there are so many interactions that, are, that occur that we're actually able to accommodate a lot of variation, uh, both uh, in development as well as in evolution. And I think that's up an important point about, uh, that we can learn from studying the heads. And of course, there are, there are ways in which we can formalize this more um, um, and, 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 and test it in a rigorous way. But I wanted to give you the basic flavor of the argument. So given what we know about how heads grow and evolve, um, and, and also uh, if we combine that with information from the fossil record plus uh, functional information, what can we say about what happened in evolution to make our heads so perplexingly bizarre compared to this very normal chimpanzee. <laughs> well, one of the problems, though, when we, when, we, when we approach human evolution is that it's confusing. Um, there are, um, in fact, uh, many people in my field revel in the confusion because it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of fun to make everybody 
perplexed and, uh, and confused. But actually, um, um, and, and there's a good reason, right? There's more than 20 species of, of hominins at, at this point. Um, they evolved over 7 million years. They would come from many different continents. We have lots of fossils. We have lots of genetic data. We have lots of archaeological data. It's a pretty confusing mess of information. But I'd like to uh, suggest that if you step back from all the trees and look at the forest, that there are really four really important major transformations that occurred in our evolution that made our heads more or less the way that they are. And I'm, of course, going to gloss over lots of details and talk about what I think are the really big themes. And the big themes are that those, each of those transformations was actually a fairly modest transformation that involved just sort of making do with variations that already exist, what we call tinkering. There's no new engineering. We're, we're just basically tinkered apes. Um, just change a little here, change a little bit there, and you can grow something profoundly different. In addition, all the shifts that we see were contingent on previous shifts. If, if we hadn't first diverged from apes and became bipedal, uh, we, the next set of uh, stage, we, that set the stage for the next set of transformations, which then set the stage for the next set of transformations. There wasn't anything necessary about going from chimps to humans. The, each, each event occurred only because of previous events that then set the stage for, for later events. And, the, um, and finally, I think there are four, uh, well, a bunch of major selective forces that keep showing up over and over and over again as we look at what happened in the evolution of the human head. And the ones that I find really fascinating and I think uh, merit a lot of thought are selection for living in more open habitats, selection for using energy differently, and of course selection for having really large brains such as we have today. And the end result, of course, is a lot of evolutionary change. So let's, uh, let's go through a quick tour of some of those shifts so that at the end, hopefully, you'll, when you <coughs> look in the mirror tomorrow and you and you look at that blemish on your nose or whatever. Um, actually, I don't see any blemishes on anybody's noses. I was just thinking about my own nose. But um, um, you'll have some sense of maybe where and why those features are the way they are. And the very first set of shifts really are the origins of, of the human lineage, uh, the hominin. So a hominin, by the way, is, a, is the formal term for any creature that's more closely related to you uh, than to a chimpanzee. Now, when I was a first starting off, um, many people thought that this was the basic tr tree of, uh, of the relationship between humans and the other apes because um, gorillas and chimpanzees are actually extremely similar to each other. It doesn't take a, a PhD to figure out that these two things look very much like each other. And so it made sense uh, in, in, in before genetic data was available to assume that gorillas and chimpanzees were more closely related to each other than either are to humans. But genetic data has proved that wrong and that we now know definitively that humans are much more closely related to chimpanzees than either of us are to gorillas. And that means that all the similarities that we see between chimpanzees and gorillas must have either evolved independently, which is extremely unlikely, or that the last common ancestor of gorillas and this chimp-human lineage, Clay, uh, probably looked a bit like a chimpanzee or a gorilla, which is, amounts to more or less the same thing. And that means that the last common ancestor of chimpanzees and humans must have also looked very much like an African great ape, like a chimpanzee or a gorilla. Probably more like a chimp than a gorilla, because gorillas are basically unusual. They're kind of big, blown-up chimpanzees. So we can infer that the last common ancestor was probably somewhat chimp-like. It was not obviously exactly like a chimpanzee, because chimpanzees have had their own evolution too. But there must have been some chimpiness to it. Um, and it lived sometime around 7 million years ago, give or take a few million years. There's some debate still on just what that time is. And it probably lived in a forest, and it probably was uh, uh, primarily a fruit eater. And one of the sad things about our, our field is that chimps and gorillas live in, in rainforests, which are terrible for the preservation of fossils. So we actually have what a measly, pathetic record of gorilla and chimpanzee evolution. But recently, we've been blessed to discover a number of uh, very, very early hominins. Um, and in my opinion, they look very much like what we predict. They very look very much like, uh, like chimpanzees or gorillas. So this is a, a chimpanzee from the front and the side. And this is uh, the oldest known hominin skull. It's Sahelanthropus chadensis. It comes from Chad. It was discovered by Michel Brunet um, uh, in, uh, in 2001. And um, it's probably about 7 million years old. And it's a remarkably complete skull. Um, and this is uh, a species that was discovered in, uh, originally in 1994 and recently republished uh, in terms of its, uh, its reconstruction. It's a bit younger. It's called Artipithecus ramidus. Um, and it's, uh, there are actually several species, and one is about six million years old, just a bunch of teeth mostly. 
And then this skull itself is 4.4 million years old from, from Ethiopia. And I don't think it takes a, you know, um, a, a lot of uh, complex thought to realize that these critters look to a large extent like chimpanzees in terms of the shape of the face, in terms of the shape and size of the, of the brain. But there are a few, I think, very important differences. And to me, the most exciting, the most interesting difference is that these are, look like bipeds. So how do we know this? Well, when you're walking around, for the most part, unless it's a really bad day in you know, Cambridge, most of the time, uh, we look where we're going. We look forward, right? Um, most animals uh, uh, orient their orbital plane, actually, nearly perpendicular to the horizontal plane of the Earth, right? That's, uh, doesn't actually, believe it or not, there are people who have done their PhDs to test that hypothesis. But there we are. That's science. And furthermore, we know that your neck sticks off the back of your skull from your frame and magnum, and the top of the neck is always pretty much 90 degrees perpendicular to the plane of the frame and magnum. And the reason for that is to avoid shearing forces at that joint, which you don't want to shear your neck off your head. That would be a really bad thing, right? <laughs> so we, now, we know if you have a skull, right, you can orbit, orient it the way you'd be looking when you're walking, and you know where the orientation of the frame and magnum is, you know the orientation of the upper neck. And so human necks point downwards, just as we know, and chimp necks point backwards, just as we know. And Sahelanthropus is so complete that we know that its neck must have pointed downwards when it was tootling around uh, Chad about seven billion years ago. And furthermore, we can make some inferences about how that occurred. And one of the things that makes the way your head grow differently from a chimpanzee is that when a chimpanzee grows the back of its head, the nuchal plane, the area on the back of its head where all these neck muscles attach, actually rotates vertically as it grows to help orient that neck backwards. But we've, and that's because the outside is gets rid of bone and the inside adds bone and it kind of rotates like a hinge. But we've actually reversed that growth plane so that our necks and backs of our skulls rotate downward so that it orients the, the bottom of the skull and the frame and magnet downward. And we can infer, it's a hypothesis at this point, that that's the major shift that made, uh, turned a, an ape-like creature into Sahelanthropus and enabled it to be a biped, at least from the neck down. Uh, of course, what we are lacking is information from below the neck to know just how it walked. The other thing that makes these early hominins different is what is, is as to, it relates to how they chew. So they have much bigger, thicker molars. So here's a chimpanzee's jaw, and here's the jaw of Sahelanthropus, and you can just see how much bigger those molars are, and you can even just kind of just feel how much thicker the, the enamel is on those molars. Its canines shrank uh, a fair degree, and finally it pulled forward. Uh, its upper face, so where the masseter, the big muscle here along on the side of your head, it's pulled forward um, so that it gives, has a more vertical face, and that would have made it a much better chewer, uh, for, better at chewing sort of hard and tough foods. And those sorts of shifts uh, make sense because we know that the Earth at this time period was cooling. So this is a graph of the Earth's temperature over the last 70 million years, and at this time period, we know there was a major cooling of the Earth's uh, atmosphere. Uh, this is actually the Earth's ocean, excuse me. So it's getting colder. And we know from the fossil record and from other sources of information that Africa was shifting from being primarily forested to, to being more wooded. So we had a transition from rainforests, which were, would be loaded with fruit, to woodland habitats, which would have much less fruit. And when, if you're an ape, ape or an early hominin, and you're living in, and you really like fruit, and, you're, and you, you're living here, and all of a sudden you're living here, the first thing you're going to notice is that there's probably not as much fruit around for dinner all the time. And so we think that these shifts that we see uh, in these first hominins make sense in terms of this shift in landscape. Because um, being a biped may, might have made our ancestors really, uh, might have, one advantage might have been for feeding. But another important uh, advantage of bipedalism, and of course we don't know uh, all the details of these early hominins, but at, at some point, we became much less costly at, at locomoting than, uh, than chimpanzees. So a human uses a quarter the energy to move a kilogram of its body a meter than a chimpanzee by being bipedal. Chimpanzees are essentially very costly, and we're much, much, much less costly um, because of uh, the way we walk. And of course, the other shifts that we see would have made our ancestors much more effective at chewing um, uh, fallback foods, less preferred foods that are less preferred than fruit, tougher harder foods. Okay. So uh, if you think about Barbara Streisand's skull, and I've here tried to kind of imagine it inside of her head, she can thank those first hominins for having smaller canines, slightly thicker tooth enamel, and a short and vertical neck. That's about it. But still, it's a start. Okay. 
So we would all be basically apes living in the edge of a forest, munching on fruit for the most part, but occasionally eating harder stuff. Uh, if it weren't for another group of creatures uh, that evolved starting around four million years ago called the Australopiths. And the Australopiths uh, are a radiation. There's actually a whole slew of these creatures. And they evolved also during times of climate change. Again, remember, my, one of my arguments was that climate change is a recurring theme in driving the human head to be the way it is. So this is, again, a graph of the Earth's temperature over that time period. And you can see that during the Pliocene, again, it got cooler. And we know we went from an environment that had probably more fruit to an increasingly open environment. But there's you know, lots of fluctuations along the way, so it wasn't a simple linear path towards less fruit. And that meant that our ancestors probably had to rely on other foods, such as underground storage organs, like tubers and roots, seeds, or pits. We call these things often fallback foods. <laughs> and what we see in the fossil record is a, is a whole series of experiments. Uh, uh, there's a radiation of australopiths, and there, there are two general groups. We, some of them we call the gracile australopiths, because they're, well, they're not so big as the other group called the robust australopiths, which had huge faces and big teeth and large chewing muscles. These were, these were no, no, um, no, um, um, these are pretty mean chewers as well. Um, and of course, the most famous of these is, is Lucy, but there's a whole group of them. But they all more or less represent various responses to this, uh, this general challenge. And um, they're in many ways very primitive. So like apes, they still had pretty small brains. So these are the, the brain sizes of these Australopiths. And here's some chimpanzee brain sizes. And there's some later brain sizes just to give you a sense of how they did. They're, you know, some of them are you know, modestly large brains, you know, 550 cubic centimeters or so. Chimps can get around 390, 400 on average, but nothing like what, what humans have. Um, and we also know that below the neck, they show all kinds of features which show they were probably good at walking, but they were also probably very good at climbing trees. But the big thing about the Australopithecines is they were, they were really good at chewing hard food. So this is a graph of uh, this is a different species. I've more or less ordered them in time. And this is the size, for example, of the second molar. And you can just see that uh, this is, these are chimpanzees, and their, their teeth are getting wider and longer um, until we get to, to the origins of the genus Homo. And this is a graph of a chimpanzee. And a, this is an Australopithecus afarensis, is what Lucy is. And this is an Australopithecus boisei, also known as Nutcracker Man. And I just, I've just, I've just um, shown the the size of the masseter, just uh, estimated its size based on the skull. And you can just see how large the, the, the masseter was in this creature, and also how tall and wide and large its face. Its face was basically like a gigantic soup plate. It was, uh, it was designed to produce huge forces, but also designed to withstand all the forces that that created in its face. And remember, you know, if you're a chimpanzee, a chimpanzee, a typical chimpanzee, according to research by Richard Rangham and, and Zareen Machando, I can see over there, a typical chimpanzee chews for about half the day. Imagine chewing half the day, right? That would be a normal day for a chimpanzee, right? And now, uh, probably chew also of these australopiths, and we've been working on analyzing the biomechanics of these skulls, and we can, we can predict, uh, we think fairly accurately, uh, how much bite force one of these creatures was able to produce with its molars, and then graph that against the area of its teeth, and you can see that, that these are Australopiths were basically up there in gorilla territory. I mean, they were, they were, they were, they were serious chompers. You would, not want to put, you would not want to have put your finger in the mouth of an Australopith. That would not have been a, a good strategy. Another fascinating little change is just really an aside, but I just can't help resist uh, telling you because I find it really interesting is that this is also when ear holes got rather big. That's the size of the acoustic auditory meatus. It's the, it's the size of the canal in which sound travels from the, outs, the outer ear into the inner ear. Um, and so in chimpanzees, they're pretty small, and they start expanding in the australopiths. And I think, again, this is evidence for selection for living in open territories, because think of the size of the tube. It acts like a filter. So you have a very narrow tube. It's going to filter out a lot of frequencies. And the wider that tube is, the more frequencies that can uh, enter the ear. And so it looks like a, an adaptation for, for living in more open environments. So you can thank those Australopiths, most of whom, fortunately, you're not related to. But nonetheless, you can thank them as a group for, for weaning us off hard f uh, fruit all the time. So it got us into kind of an open habitats with, with less fruit, and also probably for being more effective bipeds than some of those, those earlier hominids. So, so Barbara here can, can, and I didn't talk about them, but when you make your cheek teeth really big, the front teeth got smaller, their enamel got even thicker, ear hole got bigger, but eh, there's not too much Australopith in most of us. The really big shifts that started to 
turn our heads to be profoundly different from other creatures occurred with the origins of the human genus, the genus Homo, and that really started around, around two million years ago. And this was a really major transformation. If you look before and after, so Australopithecus like Australopithecus africanus and after, here's a Homo erectus, our brain size more or less doubled, our teeth shrank in size, we lost our snouts. How many of you wish you had a snout? <laughs> Sometimes I, I feel like I have a snout. Um, we added that wonderful little external nose, and all kinds of other things happened. And again, climate change looks like it was a really important part of the process. So here's a graph of the Earth's climate, again, narrowing in on that time period. And you can see that starting around a little under 3 million years ago, to about 2 million years ago, there was a really rapid uh, cooling of the Earth's climate. The oceans cooled by about 2 degrees. And over that time period, we know there was a, a further shift in Africa, and the woodlands uh, became less common, the rainforests became less common. And we begin to see much more of an open uh, savanna habitat becoming much more prevalent in Africa at this time. And we see two solutions to this shift. Now, one solution are these robust Australopiths. They actually first show up around that time period. And these are Australopiths that are just uber chewers, right? So here's a, here's a chimpanzee jaw, and here's a, uh, this is Australopithecus boisei jaw. And you can see its teeth are three times the size. Those are enormous teeth, um, and it has Chewing muscles that are the size of porterhouse steaks on the side of its head. Um, they're clearly designed for eating very low-quality food. But more or less around the same time is when we see the origins of our genus, the genus Homo. Instead of going for the low-quality stuff, we <coughs> went for the high-quality stuff. We clearly went, became high-quality food specialists. And one way of explaining that is imagine you're, a, you're a, an early hominid out there, and <coughs> you're somehow uh, in this open habitat, and you're looking around and you're asking yourself, what am I going to eat? And you look around and you, and I can guarantee you there's really not a lot to eat out there. Uh, one thing is that maybe below uh, some of these trees or below the grass, there might be some underground storage organs, which are actually very rich in nutrients, and uh, they also have lots of water and all sorts of other good yummy things to eat. And then there's also some above ground storage organs in the shape of these, of these, uh, <coughs> of these ungulates that uh, also might be uh, good to eat. So, and we know we actually started eating meat uh, on a fairly regular basis at that time. We have, we have, for example, bones from the archaeological record. This bone is 2.6 million years old, and you can see there, uh, I hope you can see, there are cut marks. Somebody made stone tools. The first stone tools occur then. They cut meat off that bone, and then they, they smashed the bone open and extracted the marrow. So, so our ancestors are eating this incredibly nutrient-rich food, um, which, is very, which is much softer and less tough, of course, than, than those tubers. And we see a shrinking of tooth size. Of the, of the, so this is a, adding up the area of the post-canine crowns of one quadrant of the jaw in Homo erectus compared to an Australopithecus africanus. But we also started to process our food as well. Right? Now, if I were to give uh, anybody in this audience a little bit of raw zebra um, and you were to chew it, I guarantee that you would have a pretty tough time chewing it. You'd chew and 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 you wouldn't ever feel particularly comfortable uh, swallowing it. The reason I know that is uh, we don't well we don't feed zebra in our lab to our students, but we feed wild uh, we feed uh, goat uh, to eat to each other, and I can and goat is a kind of pretty gamey creature actually, and I can tell you that raw goat takes a lot of effort to chew, um, and um, that's because our teeth are not very well designed for chewing food. We don't have the the shearing crest, the sort of scissor-like elements on teeth that make us very good at breaking up that those fibers. So. Uh, so one of the ways in which we, we, uh, we were able to eat meat was to process food by pounding it or cutting it up using those early stone tools. Um, and um, that would also, another big advantage of pounding in, of your food is also that it makes the particle sizes much smaller, which means that you probably get a lot more energy per unit food. Because think about enzymes. Your digestive enzymes break down particles in your body, and the effic efficacy of those enzymes is dependent on the surface area to, to volume ratio of the particles. So smaller particles get broken down much more quickly. So if you want to lose weight quickly, eat a raw food diet and don't chew, chew, chew your, uh, process your food very much, you'll, um, you'll, be, you'll shed the pounds very, very rapidly. You might, you might be kind of cranky, though, too, at the same time. And of course, later on, cooking came in and transformed everything. But that's, a, that's a later story. So, so processing uh, foods, like tubers and underground storages, became very important, but also um, um, getting uh, animal food also became very important. So the other thing that's important about the genus Homo is how we got dinner. 
And one way is, of course, if you're going to get uh, foods, well, you have, to, you have to walk long distances every day to find those tubers. And after all, you're not in a, in a rainforest with just trees filled with fruit. You have to walk long distances. Your average hunter-gatherers, you know, today walk 9 to 10 kilometers a day in order to get foods. And it's, it makes sense that, that early Homo would have had to walk the same amount. But also, if you want to eat these things, you also have to run. And so we see adaptations in the head. And, I'm, and don't worry, I'm not going to talk about running today. Um, but we see adaptations in the head for endurance athleticism, both long distance walking as well as running. So I keep going on and on about external noses. And it's not just because I'm fixated on the size of my nose and its, its beauty or lack thereof. It's also because it's a really important functional uh, part of your face. Your nose is a turbulence generator. When you breathe through your nose, it forces the air to take a right angle and go through a little valve, right? Like a valve in a garden hose. It's called a venturi throat. And that causes the air to become turbulent, because there's actually another little valve as it goes into the nasal cilia, it goes into the internal nose. And that makes the air flow in all these vorticial ways so that it, it actually interacts intimately and, and slowly with the, with, the, with the mucous membranes that are in the inside of your nose. And so that air, as it's traveling into your nose, picks up moisture, um, and because the air that you breathe into your lungs has to be humidified. And on the way out, all that turbulence helps you recapture that moisture on the way out so you don't lose all that moisture so that you can retain the moisture so you don't dehydrate easily. So we see the first evidence for external nose because we can see from the shape of the, of the nose bones that that external schnoz basically first appears early in the genus Homo. Now, the first you know, big noses, uh, the, the Barbara Streisand sized noses if you will, uh, started at least 1.8, 1.9 million years ago. But we also see in the, or in the genus Homo evidence for running. So we have all kinds of features in our head which make us really good at balancing and stabilizing our heads. We have, for example, a nearly balanced head, and that's partly that's because we lost our snouts. We have a, a nuchal ligament, which is kind of a, a very elastic spring that hangs off the back of our head and actually attaches partly through a muscle to our arm, and it helps us stabilize our heads when we run passively. And also the, the, the vestibular system, the organs of balance, which we use to, to assess when our heads are pitching or rolling, are particularly well-tuned to assess and measure rapid pitching forces on the head, much more so than australopiths or, or chimpanzees, because these bones, these organs actually preserve, uh, their shape and size preserve in fossils. So we can actually measure uh, their, how well they function and how they function in these early hominins. And so with the origins of the genus Homo, we see heads that are really adapted well to rapid pitching forces. And what causes rapid pitching forces? Well, it's not walking. It's running. So every time you run, your head wants to pitch forward really rapidly every time your body hits the ground. We can't think of anything else that would explain this shift in our ability to balance our heads. So these features that we see in the, in the origins of the genus Homo um, unleashed a, a series of other changes that we see. And one of them is bigger brains. Because once you have more energy, you can start growing a bigger brain. I mean, why is it that more animals don't have big brains? If big brains are such a good thing, shouldn't more creatures have big brains? Well, the reason they don't is because brains are really costly. Our brains cost us about 25% of our resting metabolic rate, even when we're, when we're not even paying attention to our professors, right? It's still costing us 25% of our metabolism. That's because they're so big and costly. And so it takes a lot of energy to grow a brain and synthesize a brain and maintain a brain, and that takes energy. And so with the origins of the genus Homo and the shift in energetics, we begin to see an increase in brain size. And you're doubling in brain size. And of course, when you make your brain bigger, you have to accommodate that in your head. So you need to have a, a bigger head, right? Um, so in fact, when Charles Darwin came home from, uh, from the Galapagos, I think the first thing his father said to him was, um, the shape of his head has changed, because he'd learned so much. Um, but anyway, <coughs> um, isn't that a nice way to be greeted? Anyway, um, so, uh, so when we see that with the genus Homo, particularly in Homo erectus, we see longer heads and wider heads and rounder heads to accommodate that more rounded skull. And the combination of this bigger brain and a more vertical face with those smaller teeth led to a shift in cranial anatomy. So in these australopiths, we had those nice, nice, you know, very classic ape-like snouts. And by the time we get to the genus Homo, we've lost that snout. We have a very vertical face. The face is still fairly big compared to ours today. The cranial base is more flexed, the brain is bigger, and we've lost our snout. And in essence, all these shifts and more, which I'm of course not talking about, are about a transformation in the way in which we lived. Because with the origins of the genus Homo, I believe, we see the origins of the hunting and gathering way of life, in which, in which people uh, 
um, have a division of labor, they start gathering foods, they bring it back to camp, they process, they, there's hunting, there's provisioning, there's food processing, all kinds of, uh, there's more, more, more social uh, cooperation. This is a transformation in the way in which humans live and, and, and get energy and then also use that energy uh, to, to reproduce. So this is a, a major and profound and transformative shift in our evolutionary history. So thanks to the origins of the genus Homo, we can, uh, we can thank ourselves for, for the origins of a bigger brain, a more balanced head, that fantastic external nose, which has surely helped Barbara Streisand make so much money, and the lack of a snout, her small teeth, and I haven't gone into it, but it's a good guess. It's a hypothesis, however, at this point, that that's also perhaps when we lost the fur all over our bodies and became really good at sweating, because that helped us become really good at thermoregulating so we could trek and run long distances. But uh, that's really another lecture. So finally, the, the last big shift that occurred in our evolution was the origins of us, of, of late Homo. And, and I encourage you to come to hear David Reich's talk, because David Reich has been doing just mind-bending and exciting research on the, on, on, the, on the genome of Neanderthals and the relationship between humans and Neanderthals. And I, it's just fascinating. Um, um, some of the most interesting stuff going on in science, in my opinion, today. And, and so the, the final thing I want to talk about is the origins of, of, of late Homo. So, so hunt, Homo erectus uh, and hunting and gathering was clearly a pretty good way of life because we see um, um, a lot of, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an evolutionary success story. We can see it, right? So Homo erectus first appears in Africa about 1.9 million years ago. We actually see Homo erectus in, in Georgia, um, in the Caucasus, by 1.8 million years ago. They make it into Asia, into Indonesia, by 1.6 million years ago, we think. And they're in Europe by at least 1.2 million years ago. So they rapidly are dispersing across the old world. And brains are getting bigger. So the early Homo erectus have smaller brains, up to about eight or 900 cubic centimeters. And by the end of the species' time, they have brains up there in the, uh, nearly in the human, uh, basically in the lower end of the human range. So brains almost doubled in the species over time. And that's clearly because they're doing well at getting energy, and they're able to pump that part, devote part of that energy into, into growing a larger brain. And at a certain point, paleoanthropologists kind of throw up their hands up and say, this is a bit too, too dip much change, and we need to find an, a different species in the fossil record called Homo heidelbergensis. And basically, it's a Homo erectus with a big brain. Uh, that's essentially what it is. It's just a sufficiently different morphologically that we think it deserves a separate sp uh, species name, and also it might be slightly separate uh, phylogenetically in terms of the evolutionary tree. Also, the face gets bigger as well. And, but basically, you get the, a variation on the theme. You get a long, low head and a fairly big brain and a big face. But there's not a, a really fundamental shift in anatomy here. But what's really going on in Homo erectus, in addition to the bigger brain, is that towards the, excuse me, Homo heidelbergensis, is that towards the end of that species, at least, we see a number of other inventions. We invent cooking and fire. And we finally figure out to put something sharp on the end of a stone, you know, on the end of a spear, which seems like a kind of obvious thing to do, but that's actually only about 300,000 years old that that was invented. And Homo heidelbergensis, in turn, had some descendant species. One of them <coughs> was the Neanderthals, who are, are, are uh, fascinating, and, and I would, we could basically do a whole lecture about the Neanderthals, but they evolved um, sometime, or we, we, and, excuse me, and, and, excuse me, and the other is, uh, is, is, is humans, Homo sapiens. And we last share an ancestor with the Neanderthals sometime around three to 400,000 years ago. And again, David Reich will, will tell you much more about this because the real good data on this comes not from the fossil record but from the genetic record. And then the Neanderthals moved into Europe and, and West Asia and became Neanderthali. And, and, they're, and they're very cold adapted and they have, they're very good hunters. Um, but we evolve in Africa sometime between 200 and 250,000 years ago. It's hard to be exactly precise about the date. Um, but we're quite different. So what makes us different from, say, a Homo heidelbergensis or a Neanderthal? And you could come up with a long, long list of features, but basically when you boil it down, there's two major shifts that occur. And one shift is that the brain case mu becomes much more globular, much more round. So instead of much, much less like a lemon and much more like a cantaloupe, basically. And it's actually not too far off. I mean, most of us have heads about the size of a cantaloupe, right? Um, and then the second, is that our faces become much smaller and much more retracted. So if you look at this Neanderthal or Homo heidelbergensis face, look how large it is and how it's much positioned far forward from the brain case. So if you stuck your finger through the orbit of this, uh, this poor Homo heidelbergensis, you'd basically hit bone. 
But if you stick your finger through your orbit, which of course you would never do, you'd hit your frontal lobe. Not a good thing, right? And that's a mark of the fact that your face is smaller, but also it's tucked underneath your brain case. And that leads to a whole suite of other shifts, like a, a vertical forehead and loss of those big brow ridges and, and this rounded brain case, etc. So that tongues scale in a very predictable way to body mass. So we, if you know your size, you know basically the same, the, your, your body size, you pretty much know the size of your tongue. And so there's only so many ways to fit a tongue into a mouth, right? So um, humans have a shorter mouth than an archaic human, which means we have a shorter tongue. You keep the tongue the same size, that means your tongue becomes rounder, and that means that the little bone that hangs off the base of your tongue, the hyoid, must be lower in the throat, and your larynx is suspended from your hyoid. So it's a pretty good guess that once we had shorter and rounder tongues, we had a lower larynx. Now, why is this important? Well, because the shape of your larynx helps determine the speech sounds that come out of your mouth or my mouth. It turns out that as you speak, you're using your vocal tract. So you're making a buzz with your, 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 your larynx, right? You're, you're emitting puffs of air. And then you've used the, the, all the anatomy above that sound generator to filter those sounds so that ah, eh, e, ah, o, oh, and all those silly sounds that you make um, are actually different so that you can perceive them. And it turns out, and I'm not going to go into all the acoustics, but if you have a vocal tract in which the horizontal tube, the roof of your mouth basically, and the vertical tube have the same length, and you can change the cross-sectional areas of those tubes independently, you can produce very discrete sounds that are, you don't have to work too hard to make them. This is called quantal speech. Um, it's much easier to speak clearly if you have a shape, a vocal tract like this, than like that. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't speak like that. We actually know lots of people who speak like that. They're called children, <laughs> right? Um, but it's an advantage to speak like that. So one advantage for, um, for shortening your face would be uh, more perceptible speech, uh, particularly in terms of the production of vowels. Um, there's another benefit, which I'm particularly fascinated by, which is that it also, I think, may have helped us enjoy our food more. And that's because, you, know, you may know, that 90% or 80% of flavor doesn't come from taste, it actually comes from smell. Now, now smell, most of the time we think of smelling like you take, a, you take a something unsmelly like this and you smell it like that, right? And I don't smell pretty much anything. But Smell can also, that's called orthonasal smell, but smell can also come another way. It can come out the back of your mouth. It's called retronasal smell. And because we've dropped our larynx and we've created this big open passageway in which air and food are, sh are shared, and, there's, and, and in this condition, the epiglottis, that bit of the, of the larynx that flips up, it actually touches the soft palate and forms a tube within a tube. So that actually forms a separate airway and a separate foodway. But we've lost that so that Particles, when we're chewing and talking and breathing, naturally go up the back of our throats and go into the back of our noses and hit our olfactory bulb. And so that's why when you have a really bad cold and all that's congested, your food tastes really bland. So dropping our larynx may have been really good for speech, <coughs> but also might have helped you enjoy uh, your food after dinner a little bit more. But that's a hypothesis we still want to test. That's a, I, I emphasize that's a hypothesis. That's not a, that's not a fact. But there's a big problem with that, and that is that once we did that, we, we lost that tube within a tube, and we created this big common pathway for food um, and air, and the result is that we are much more susceptible uh, to choking on food than a lot of other creatures. My, my, my former dog used to steal hot dogs from the administrative assistant upstairs on the fifth floor of the Peabody, and <coughs> we would rush after her and tackle her, and she would cough up the entire hot dog, which she would able to swallow without chewing. I have, I have, I have witnesses to this feat. No human being, uh, nobody ate the hot dogs afterwards. Well, we would try to wash them and put them back in the, in the but, but no human being can do that. You would die if you swallowed an entire hot dog. Um, 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 and that's because we have that shared tooth way. In fact, in fact, the fourth leading cause of accidental death in humans today is actually choking on our food. So this is a, a serious price that we've paid for this redesign of our, of our larynx, perhaps for, for speech. And then, of course, the other thing that may have happened with the shift of our, of our, of our heads and the rounder brain was maybe a reorganization of the brain. And unfortunately, of course, we don't have any fossil brains. We just have fossil brain cases. So we can only kind of look at them almost like phrenologists, right? 
kind of hoping that we can guess something about the brain, but actually we can make some reasonable clues. Now, one of them is that if you look at the base of the cranial base, different parts of your brain are held by different parts of it. And, the, and there's a part called the middle cranial fossa, which actually cradles your temporal lobes. And we've shown that the cr middle cranial fossa in humans is actually about 20% larger <coughs> after you correct for the size of the head than in, say, Neanderthals or Homo erectus or archaic humans. And since the temporal lobe lies in that, it's a pretty good inference that the temporal lobe was about 20% bigger in humans than in these archaic humans. In fact, we also know that the temporal lobe is about 20% bigger in humans compared to chimpanzees after you correct for brain size. So we know that that enlargement occurred at some point in human evolution, and it looks like that enlargement occurred actually with the origins of Homo sapiens. Uh, it's a little harder to figure out the size of the parietal lobes, but there's reasonable evidence that uh, that also increased in size. And there's some reason to believe, though it's very hard to pinpoint which species, um, that the prefrontal cortex also got bigger. Well, we know it got bigger in human evolution, and let's just hypothesize, just for fun, that we don't actually know this for factually, that it got larger in, the, in Homo sapiens. And, and finally, we also know from work uh, done here at Harvard, actually, by my colleague Tanya Smith, that, that we also started taking a lot longer to grow. So we have longer childhoods, but even more importantly, we also have longer periods of adolescence. We all know from our teenagers that, that a lot of brain changes occur, of course, during that time period as well. So if you lengthen that period of time, maybe it's a little bit rough on parents. Of course, not us. We have a, an ideal uh, teenager. But, but, um, but, um, um, but that longer period of development, of course, helps you prune the brain and mature it and, and become a, a better adult. So we can make the hypothesis that these reorganization in the shape of the brain uh, tell us something about the cognitive skills that humans had compared to other archaic humans. And, and we know that the temporal lobe was very involved, for example, in memory and in language. Um, the, 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 the prefrontal cortex is very important in planning and control and theory of mind and restraining your urges and all kinds of things like that. And a hypothesis is that these shifts in the brain helped make possible really major revolution that occurred in the archaeological uh, record around 40 to 50,000 years ago called the Upper Paleolithic, when all of a sudden we get this explosion of cultural change. We get the origins of, of new kinds of tool forms. We start making bone tools, and we invented the bow and arrow, and we start making art, and all kinds of shifts occurred. And when those shifts occurred, humans moved out of Africa and quickly spread throughout the entire world and pretty much replaced all the other uh, species living elsewhere. Although, as David Reich will tell you, there was a very small amount of interbreeding that occurred between humans and Neanderthals, maybe around 80,000 years ago uh, in the Middle East. And maybe there was some other interbreeding as well uh, that occurred uh, in, in, in Asia as people were on their way to Australia. And that's, a, that's one of the really interesting frontiers of human evolution to study at this point. So we can thank our first Homo sapiens ancestors for quite a few shifts in our heads that we think are pretty normal when we look in the mirror. A very wide, round, tall brain case, a vertical forehead, a small brow ridge or lack thereof completely, a small retracted face, a chin, which by the way, nobody knows why we have it, a round tongue, a low larynx, and more. So in short, we've come a really long way, but not all at once. We didn't go straight from chimps to, to humans. There were a lot of intermediate stages, and I hope I've convinced you that each of these stages was contingent on previous changes, that there were a few major uh, uh, forces. Climate change was very important, but also uh, energy and brains were also very important in making our heads the way we are. And all of this was made possible by all that complexity I was talking about in the first part of the lecture. Right? If we hadn't had that accommodative mechanisms to, to, to allow a bigger brain to grow, to allow a smaller face or a bigger face or bigger teeth, or a bigger nose or a smaller nose to grow, all these evolutionary shifts would not have been possible, or they would be much harder to, ha to have occurred, and perhaps the selection might never have happened at all. So selection was able to off uh, operate in a way, much more, in a much more unfettered way than you might think if you had to engineer all those changes. You know, if you want to have a bigger brain, you have to figure out how you're going to get those eyes to fit under the brain, how to get that nose to fit with those eyes, and get how to fit the, the mouth with that nose with those eyes. It's an engineer's nightmare, but natural selection was able to solve that problem easily um, without, because of the accommodative mechanisms. So finally, um, as we uh, head off uh, um, into, this, uh, <coughs> into the, into the, into the mirror-gazing phase of our, of our life, um, a final question to ask is, is where are we headed, right? And uh, I happen to love to, uh, to, every time these articles come on the, on the, on the internet or newspaper, <laughs> I'm always fascinated by them. <laughs> 
because there's a few repetitive themes. The, the, this is the most common, right? Um, that we're going to just, we're so smart. It's, this is like the Piltdown fallacy, right? That what makes, Piltdown was really a, a forgery, right? A hoax in which they, they made a really big brained, they basically combined a big brained human and a, an orangutan and kind of made them all look like a fossils uh, because everybody thought that the brain was the most important thing in human evolution. Well, if we continue to have that, that, think, that thought that you know, brains are really the most important thing, well, then obviously if it's going to happen in our future. We're going to get bigger and bigger brains. Um, and um, well, maybe that will happen, um, but um, I doubt it. Um, another idea is that we might just replace our brains all overall with, uh, with computers and uh, other gadgets. And then finally, there are people who are out there, alarmists mostly, um, but maybe they're not <laughs> completely wrong, uh, who worry about the future of pollution and that we'll have, we'll have to have selection for all kinds of detoxification pouches and, <laughs> and, and ears that can handle, that can keep us from all the sound and noise that we're creating and, and, and large pupils with uh, membranes that can protect us from pollution, etc. Well, I don't know about any of those futures, uh, th th those future scenarios because af after all, evolutionary biologists are, are well, we're, we're reasonably pathetic at, at trying to figure out what happened in the past where we have no right really trying to figure out what happens in the future, but I do think that there are some interesting uh, trends that we see in our biology that only make sense really uh, in terms of the light of evolution. And one example I'd like to uh, talk about is oral health, since it's something that concerns all of us, right? So we obviously evolved to eat a paleolithic diet, which we've sort of already talked about in, indirectly, right? A diet that's low in starch and high in protein and it's pretty tough and pretty hard and you, maybe you don't have to chew all, you know, half the day like a chimpanzee, but I bet a homo erectus was still, you know, chomping pretty hard during the day. Well, today, of course, we can eat foods that are incredibly rich in sugar and carbohydrates and full of saturated fats. And in fact, you can spend your entire day and never actually have to chew at all, right? In fact, there may even be undergraduates at Harvard who actually accomplish that task, right? Um, you can suck your entire meal out of a straw, morning, noon, and night, right? And of course, uh, those uh, diets lead to a set of problems. So one of those problems are cavities, right? Cavities are caused by um, well, uh, bacteria in your mouth that love to eat all those uh, sugars, and they then produce acid, which then dissolve our teeth. So what do we do? We cope with this problem through a mechanism we call cultural buffering. Cultural buffering is when we, when we create um, uh, technologies to cope with that mismatch between between the, in the biology that we inherited and the world that we live in today. So for us, cultural buffering, for example, includes brushing your teeth. If you brush your teeth, you're much less likely to get cavities. Or if you force your children to brush their teeth, they're also much less, less likely to get cavities. Um, but of course, they still will get cavities, and we still get cavities because we don't do our, brush our teeth very well. So we have other forms of cultural <laughs> buffering, which are a little less pleasant. Um, we have to get fillings, sometimes without the benefit of anesthesia. Um, sometimes root canals and extractions, etc. And I can just feel some of you wincing in the audience. Uh, those of you who aren't probably are, are dentists. Um, but a, a more difficult problem, which because you know we can always go to a dentist, although I suggest you not pick these gentlemen as your dentist. But a more difficult problem is caused by eating soft food. Again, remember chimpanzees spend half their day eating, and we don't know how much of the day a Homo erectus or an early human spent eating, but it was certainly much more than we do today, and they were producing much higher bite forces. And again, people are eating these soft processed food. They're not chewing very forcefully. And as a result, our jaws aren't actually growing very large. We actually have abnormal growth of our faces because our faces are designed by evolution to experience certain forces, certain stresses, which then cause certain deformations, which actually trigger normal growth in the face. So when we remove that stimulus, we get malocclusions. And we don't even have enough space in our jaw for our wisdom teeth to erupt. And of course, a few thousand years ago, or actually a few hundred years ago, you know, an impacted wisdom tooth could spell death because it could cause an infection and without antibiotics, uh, you could easily die. So we've, we're interested in this, and so one of the things we've been doing is uh, interested in how much cooking has affected the way our faces grow, and since we can't uh, do that on humans, we've been looking at hyraxes, which are actually the closest living relative to elephants. <coughs> And you think that's a kind of odd choice for experimental animal, but actually they're quite useful because they actually chew uh, underneath their, their, their faces, underneath their eyes like humans do, and they actually have fused symphyses. Their jaws are a single bone, and, and they're, 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 they actually chew in a fairly human-like way. So we got these hyraxes, by the way, which we, we, we sent to zoos afterwards, so don't, don't worry about the hyraxes. And we fed some of them <coughs> the exact same diet. Some of them we fed dried food, so here's a dried apple, and some of them we kind of lightly microwaved the apple so they were kind of soft, but the same diet nutritionally. 
And then we looked at the faces, at the strains that they were generating, and we can see that the higher axis chewing harder food generated much higher uh, forces and much higher strains, and, that, and they grew their jaws about 6 to 10%, 10% smaller. And we've also done the same thing on, on pigs as well. Um, and those are actually quite similar to some of the shifts that we see in human evolution. So for example, here's a, a comparison from a very famous paper by uh, Van Gervin and Carlson, which showed that if you compare people from uh, Nubia, for example, modern Nubians have faces that are about 10 to 20% shorter than Nubians who lived uh, a few thousand years ago. We've shrunk our faces um, um, as considerably, even after you correct for any other changes in overall cranial size. And that, a lot of that comes from eating much softer, much more processed food. So what are our choices? Well, you can either keep going to the orthodontist. Um, and again, please be careful which orthodontist you choose um, and get braces and various things like that, which is what most of us do now. Or perhaps we can um, 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 think more about our evolutionary history and maybe encourage more gum chewing. How many of you parents tried to prevent your children from chewing too much gum? Nobody's willing to admit. Well, one person's willing to admit. But I, I certainly wasn't allowed to chew very much gum. When I was young, I think my parents, as much as I love them and as I respect them and have much to thank them, I think they were wrong in this respect. Because maybe, <laughs> maybe I would have grown a slightly larger face and I would have had less uh, dental problems um, if I had been able to chew gum. And also, of course, uh, having our children eat more processed, less processed food might also help us uh, increase uh, the health of our of our of our oral cavity. And of course, there's added benefits as well. If you don't process your food, you get fewer calories out of it. So the bottom line is that we have all kinds of problems we face, you know, having to wear glasses, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of these problems and understanding the biology of our heads really only makes sense in the light of evolution. And I think that uh, there's a lot to learn uh, from considering uh, how our heads grow and function and evolve in an integrated fashion. Uh, not only about who and why we are, but also how we can use our bodies. So uh, with that, I'd like to say that you know, the most important thing is that we should enjoy each other's heads. And I'd particularly like to thank uh, some folks here, including my, my family, my ever-suffering uh, wife and daughter, my former advisors, my parents, people who read the book, Michael Fisher from Harvard Uni University Press, who actually gave me the opportunity to do this. And of course, folks from my lab and colleagues and, and others who, who have helped out. So thank you very much.